This is the second installment in what will be a Raspberry Pi LCD display series, which will pretty much be guided by the YouTube viewers. I received a request to create a demo showing button inputs interacting with an LCD display, such as in a calculator. So this video will focus on how to interface switches and display the results on an LCD display. I'll be using the Adafruit LCD display library, which I explained in detail in the first video of this series. This video builds on that video, so I'd check it out if you haven't. I changed the six GPIO pins used to connect the LCD display to the Pi from ones used in my previous video. I'm using 22 for RS, 23 for enable, and 24 through 27 for the data 4 through 7. Make sure you update the Adafruit car LCD file init statement with these new default numbers. A quick search of my parts bin revealed this Gray Hill hexadecimal keypad. Therefore, I decided to build a hex conversion calculator. Usually keypads have a matrix interface, but this one just uses a pin for each button and a common ground, which is easier and better suited for this demo. To read the state of a switch, we connect one end of the switch to any numbered GPIO pin and the other end to ground. When the switch is off, the pin will be high or at 3.3 volts. When we pull the pin with the GPIO input method, it'll return true. Then when the switch is pressed, the GPIO pin will be shorted to ground. The pin is then set to be low and the GPIO input method will return false. Therefore, the Pi can tell by the voltage of the pin the state of the switch. In this scenario, true for released and false for pressed. There is one caveat in this simple example. If a pin is not connected high or low, it's in an arbitrary state known as floating. To avoid this unreliable situation, which would occur in the release state, we use a pull-up resistor. The pull-up connects the GPIO pin to 3.3 volts or high via a resistor usually around 10,000 ohms. This locks the default state of the pin to high and guarantees the pin will read low when pressed and high when released. The resistor throttles the current. You don't ever want to connect the VCC directly to ground. This can lead to smoke and damaged GPIO pins. A cool feature of the Pi is that it has built-in pull-up and pull-down resistors, which you can enable in software when you call the GPIO setup method. Here is a large push-button switch. If you look close, you can see the metal contacts closing when I press it. All I have to do to get it working with the Pi is connect two of the terminals. I'll connect the green one to ground, then I will connect the red one to GPIO 21. When I press the button, GPIO 21 will be grounded and the Pi will read it in a low state or false. When released, the pull-up will pull the GPIO to 3.3 volts and the Pi will read it as high or true. There are two common methods for reading the state of an IC pin. The first is polling, where the state is checked in the main program loop each cycle. The second is using interrupts. We'll start with polling, which is more basic. As always, before installing anything, it's a good idea to run sudo apt-get update. Next, I'll use sudo apt-get install to make sure I have the latest versions of the Python RPI GPI library for Python 2 and Python 3. There was some confusion in my previous video regarding permissions. An important note is that the GPIO requires super user access, so I'll use GKSU to open up idle with the necessary permissions. I import RPI GPIO and then check which version is installed. The code in this video will require at least version 0.5.2a. I put together a simple program template which I'll use throughout this video. It starts by making sure the Adafruit library is in the Python path. I received a few questions regarding sys path append. I'll delete the path and show you how to find it. Open up the file manager and make sure you are in the folder where you downloaded the Adafruit libraries. I used my home directory. Double click to open the main Adafruit folder. Double click on the Adafruit car LCD folder, which contains the required LCD module. Copy the full path in the address bar and paste it into the append method parameter between the quotes. Now the import statement will have no trouble locating the Adafruit car LCD module. Next, the template instantiates an LCD and clears the display. The time module is needed because the main program loop uses the sleep method. RPI GPIO is imported and the mode is set to BCM which lets you refer to the pins by their GPIO number. This is the main program loop. The while true loop will continue to run until the program is halted, such as with control C. The sleep command throttles the loop to run once every second. The finally statement will run when the program exits. Here we make sure to clean up the GPIO. You'll probably encounter errors if you omit this step, so always clean up. Okay, let's set up a GPIO pin for input. The first parameter is the BCM number. 
Here we'll use GPIO 16 and specify in for input. The last parameter turns on the pull-up resistor. This will ensure the default state of an unpressed button is high at 3.3 volts. Again, this is to ensure the pin doesn't float. I'll paste in a conditional code snippet. The GPIO input method will check GPIO pin 16 every second. 1 is equal to true, which indicates high. If the pin is high, the release state will be sent to the LCD display. 0 equals false, which indicates low. If the pin is low, the press state will be displayed. I'll run the program. On my breadboard, I have a small push button connected via the orange patch cable to GPIO 16 and the other end to ground. The LCD display shows the button is not pressed. When I press and release the button, the display will change accordingly to show the state of the button. I can also bypass the button by connecting the GPIO directly to ground, which is the same as what the button does. You may have noticed that there was some lag between the display and the button presses. This is one of the disadvantages of polling. It's only as fast as the loop, and the faster the loop, the more computer resources you're using, which is very inefficient. Usually the better way to read switches is with interrupts, which are events that can fire when a GPIO pin changes states. They interrupt the program loop and execute a callback function immediately. Afterwards, the main loop resumes where it was interrupted. Back in the program template, I've removed the polling code from the main loop. The GPIO add event detect method will add an interrupt for GPIO pin 16. Rising indicates it'll occur when the button is released and the pin rises from low back to high. The name of the callback function is button pressed. The pin will be debounced to 150 milliseconds, which I'll explain later. A counter variable is added to track button presses. Finally, I'll post in the code for the button press callback function. This will simply clear the LCD, increment the counter, and display the value of the counter on the LCD display. That's it for the program. The main program loop will remain empty because everything is handled by the interrupts and callbacks. Now the LCD is updated the instant I release the push button. If you prefer to fire the callback as soon as the button is pressed, then change rising to falling. This will execute when the GPIO pin falls from 3.3 volts to ground. Now the instant my finger presses the button, the LCD is updated. Before I had to release the button to register an increment to the counter. Now it occurs as soon as the button is depressed. You'd expect that when you press a switch that the voltage would transition from 3.3 volts to ground instantly like in this graph, but that's not the way it works. Switches are made of flexible metal and springs which tend to flap a little when pressed together or pulled apart. It's like when you drop a ball, it doesn't just land on the ground, it bounces a few times first. This happens with switches but much quicker, usually only a few milliseconds. Still, the pie is fast enough to see these bounces and it can get confused. The graph actually looks more like this. Therefore, it's necessary to debounce the switch. If I press the button quickly five times, the counter is incremented correctly and another five presses also works. This is because I already determined that 150 milliseconds is the optimal bounce time for this particular switch in code. I'll lower the bounce to 50 milliseconds and rerun the program. When I press the button five times, I get an extra press. Another five and I get two more extra presses. This is because the debounce time is too short to mitigate the switch bounce. Those uncaught bounces show up as additional button presses. What happens if I raise the bounce time to 500 milliseconds? Now five presses incorrectly translates to two presses. This is because I'm pressing the switch faster than the debounce time and those presses are getting ignored along with the bounce. Therefore you have to experiment to find the optimum time that will be quick enough to catch your fastest presses but slow enough to catch all the bounce. Here the hex keypad is connected to the Pi along with the LCD. I'm using a Raspberry Pi B+, which has more than enough GPIO pins to accommodate the 6 outputs for the LCD and the 17 input switches. I'm using GPIO 2 through 15 for hex keys 2 through F and GPIO 20 and 21 for keys 0 and 1. I'm also using GPIO 16 for a toggle switch, which will toggle the display between the top line for decimals and the bottom line for hexadecimal. Here is the completed hex calculator program. The blinking cursor is enabled. The LCD begin method defines the number of columns and rows for my 16 by 2 display. I have variables to track the current row and column and to hold the line value. Instead of typing 17 setup commands, I'll create a channel list for all my inputs. I can then call the GPIO setup method and pass in the list. This will initialize all 17 pins at once as inputs with their pull-up resistors on. Next, I'll set up the initial row state depending on the state of the toggle switch. Then position the cursor appropriately. 
Here is the callback function for the toggle switch. It's fired when the toggle switch changes. A rising input indicates the position for the first line, which is for decimal numbers. If the line is empty, it'll just clear the display. Otherwise, it'll perform the conversion from hex to decimal and display the results. A falling input indicates the second line for hex numbers. Again, if the other line is empty, it just clears the display. If not, it converts the decimal number to hex and displays the results. Here is the callback for keypad presses. Since there are no GPIO 0 or 1, I used 20 and 21. In these two cases, 20 is subtracted so all the GPIO channels match up with their corresponding keypad base 10 values. The first row is only for base 10 so all letter presses are ignored. Here the line is appended with the keypad presses formatted to hexadecimal. Then the cursor is positioned using the set cursor method and the key is added to the LCD display. The column variable is also updated. Finally, the line is limited to 16 characters since this is a 16 by 2 display. The deck variable is for debugging and can be ignored. Next, I'll add an interrupt for the toggle switch. Since we need to check when the switch goes low and when it goes high, the both parameter is passed. Because I just took care of the toggle switch separately, I'll pop it out of the channel list, which I'll use in a for loop to generate the 16 other interrupts for all the hex keypad buttons. The interrupt events will be fired when the keypad buttons are released. That's all it takes. Again, the main loop is empty because everything is interrupt driven. I'll type 10, which converts to hex value A. Now I'll clear, and I'll type a longer number and convert it. I can also go the other direction. Hex B converts to decimal 11. And here's a very large hex number conversion. Okay, I hope you found this video helpful. If you want me to continue this series, just let me know in the comments what you'd like to see. You can support this channel by subscribing or leaving a like. Also, please check out my website, rototron.info, for more projects and information. Thanks for watching.